on this Sunday night. Because it's not just up to the federal government. This really has to be a team approach internationally and also here in Canada. The government says the world's latest climate change deal is cause for optimism. But with so much urgency, why did nations not agree on new targets for reducing emissions? Everybody wants details and none are really available. Ontario takes out the scissors to deal with a massive provincial debt. Why residents likely haven't seen anything yet. Adrian, I have never in my life run up against such immovable power. And when that power turns on you, it's terrifying. And two decades after coming out, Mark Tewksbury with his very personal take on the Olympics, what he says he'd do if he was in charge. This is The National. The time frame was tight, just two weeks. The task was an ambitious one, agreement, agreement among all nations. And the target was tricky, one new set of global standards. But the urgency, crystal clear, unrelenting climate change. After intense talks went into overtime to overcome an impasse, finally there was a breakthrough. Leaders from almost 200 countries, including Canada, found some common ground. Salima Shivji has a closer look at the new rule book that critics say doesn't go nearly far enough. It is so decided. With that, the deal is done. To cheers and jubilance from political leaders after a long night of negotiations. To save the promises to fight climate change made three years ago in Paris. Now each country that signed on will have to keep track of their progress. Richer countries will help poorer ones pay for their measures to tackle global warming. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> Arriving home, the leader of Canada's delegation was full of praise. But in this day and age where we've seen challenges with different international organizations and you know, a different geopolitical alliance out there. You had almost 200 countries come together and have really tough negotiations, but on the end, agree on something that is so critically important, climate change. But there was plenty they couldn't agree on. How to count the emissions reduced in cap and trade systems like Quebec's, that's shelved until next year. So too, the need to do more to limit the planet's rise in temperature to 1.5 degrees, instead of simply talking about it. For some environmentalists, that means tackling the question of fossil fuels head on. Starting a, a difficult conversation that Canada needs to have about how we're going to transition away from our dependence on the oil and gas industry. Difficult indeed. I hope they can hear us in Ottawa. In Grand Prairie today, more than a thousand people rallied to remind the country that Alberta is struggling. They want the pipeline that Ottawa bought built, a project seen by others as an obstacle to the federal government's climate targets. They're simply not credible as long as they own and build pipelines and expand fossil fuels when the scientists have been very clear. A difference of opinion that underscores an enduring truth. However tough international negotiations may be, Canada's hardest climate change battles will be fought at home. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. The size and scope of Canada's delegation gives you a sense of the importance the government attached to COP24. There were more than 100 strong, including members from every political party, provinces from B.C. to Quebec, labour unions, and a company working in the heart of Alberta's oil sands. Leading the team, of course, was Environment and Climate Change Minister Catherine McKenna. Canada still has a long way to go to meet its own targets. I caught up with her just as she got off the plane at the Ottawa airport. Minister McKenna, thanks for taking the time to speak with us. Great to be here. So there was no agreement to scale up emissions targets further to respond to the scientific evidence, obviously, that no G20 country is doing enough. Why did Canada agree to put those kinds of talks off, given the urgency of the situation? Well, the talks were always about the rule book. So the rule book's, rule book's critically important if you want to have ambition because you need trust. You need trust that countries are actually going to live up to what they're doing. And the Paris Agreement provides for uh, increasing ambition every five years. So that's already part of it. There was a recognition of the science around climate change, this 1.5 degree UN report. That did cause some controversy and started the negotiations a bit in a tough 
on tough ground when the US, um, Saudi Arabia and some other countries weren't recognizing the science. I mean, we certainly did. That's why we're working so hard in Canada across the board, but working with provinces, working with cities, working with businesses, working with indigenous peoples, because it's not just up to the federal government. This really has to be a team approach internationally and also here in Canada. But if the UN and others are now saying we're looking at about a decade before things start getting more severe, can we really afford to sit and wait before we actually scale up emissions targets again? I don't think anyone's sitting around and waiting. We're certainly not sitting around and waiting in Canada. We have like over 50 different initiatives that we're doing at the federal level, working with provinces and cities and businesses, everything from phasing out coal to putting a price on pollution to making historic investments in public transportation, supporting cleaner solutions and innovation. But I think the, the UN report made clear that we don't have time on our side, that we need to be serious about acting, and that's why we're working so hard internationally. That's why we're working so hard here in Canada. You alluded to the difficulty around the language, and the United States was part of that. Given the difficulty uh, the United States, the current administration, seems to have with dealing with climate change, who is stepping up on the world stage that is maybe surprising or different to fill that void? Well, I think you've seen a real shift, that you had one country, the U.S. was playing a really critically public role. Um, they were there at the negotiations and they were being useful you know, behind the scenes. But you've seen, I mean, Canada's really stepped up. Uh, Canada created an alliance uh, with the EU and also China, but also playing a role with developing countries, because you really need to bridge the gap between developed and developing countries and ultimately have trust. And so that's, I think, a really important role Canada can play. People respect Canada. They know that we are committed to finding solutions. And in the climate talks, they know we're serious. We needed to show that the momentum around the Paris Agreement is there, that we now have the rules of the game, that we need to be more ambitious, and that we're all stepping up. Minister McKenna, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Now to Ontario, where Doug Ford's cash-strapped government has cut funding to various groups and agencies since coming into power. This weekend, school boards are the latest to grapple with sudden austerity. The progressive conservatives were elected on a plan of fiscal restraint without layoffs. The CBC's Natalie Nanowski looks at how they're doing it so far and who's crying foul. School boards were informed by email on Friday that a special fund was being cut by $25 million. It provides programs for students with special needs and from low-income families. There was even a program designed to keep at-risk youth off the street after Toronto's spike in gun violence. Now Canada's largest school board is scrambling to assess the damage. I think most boards had the same reaction, that it was surprising. And we're only on Sunday now, so everybody wants details and none are really available. Some think the timing and method is part of the plan. Normally the government will make an announcement during the regular day. It is a decision that they own. This one feels sneaky. A statement from the province says the fund has a long track record of wasteful spending. This cut comes on the heels of others, cuts to midwives, the Indigenous Culture Fund, and of course, cuts to French services, which sparked numerous protests. Doug Ford's government says it's been saddled with about a $15 billion deficit by the free-spending Liberals, and tough decisions are needed. It was a deficit. We chose that because we thought uh, there was a greater investment that needed to be done in infrastructure. That's not the vision of this government. Fair enough. Uh, but now we need to know what, are their, what is their vision. I think we see that the cuts are going to be borne by uh, the poorest in our society. They could be doing it quite cynically. Uh, I hope not, but they could be thinking, well, these are people who were never going to vote for us in the first place, so they're really not losing any. We asked the government to clarify how much has been cut overall and where they plan to trim next, but we haven't heard back. School boards hope they'll get a clearer picture on their cuts tomorrow. Natalie Nanowski, CBC News, Toronto. Let's dig a bit deeper on this with the CBC's Queen's Park reporter, Mike Crawley. Mike, how significant are these funding changes in terms of getting rid of Ontario's $14.5 billion deficit? Not at all significant, Rosemary. A drop in the bucket, really. You add up all these cuts, you're talking about something like $30 million. So you do the math, they'd have to find 
500 more cuts like this to balance the budget. Look, the, the fact is that the salaries of public sector workers account for the vast majority of the provincial budget. So it's kind of hard to see how they could get rid of the deficit without tackling those things. Okay, so presumably that, that might happen. Where would the Ford government do that? Well, the biggest salary expense is in the greater public sector. So people like nurses, doctors, teachers, police officers. The government's already facing some tough contract negotiations. They couldn't get a deal with workers at Ontario's nuclear power plants. So uh, they've called back MPPs tomorrow for emergency back-to-work legislation. And when it comes to even more militant unions, like the teachers, it's going to be even harder uh, to get deals with them. And those contracts expire next summer. That's probably why he's tackling some of this so early on in his mandate. Ontario's credit rating, though, uh, got hit with a downgrade this week, too. How does all of that factor into this? Well, a downgrade means the province has to pay higher interest on the debt that it accumulates. Ontario already has a huge debt. The province is spending more on interest payments than it spends on any sector other than health and education. So that credit downgrade, it's only going to make balancing the budget even harder. CBC Queen's Park reporter Mike Crawley in Toronto tonight. Thanks, Mike. You're welcome. To break down some of what Mike said there, the problem with deficits is they do add up. Ontario projects its total debt will surpass $347 billion in the current fiscal year. That's not just more than any other province, but any subnational state in the world. The interest charges, uh, also high as Mike mentioned, this year exceed $12 billion. Tomorrow marks two months since recreational cannabis became legal in Canada, like just yesterday. That was clearly a very big deal. So big, news editors have voted it Canada's business story of the year, easily apparently beating out the new NAFTA agreement. But as with any new business, there are growing pains. Legal stores have been slow to open. Their numbers vary widely across the country. And that means there are places where the black market continues to thrive. As Laura Lynch shows us, Vancouver is among many cities still trying to weed out illegal shops. Days after a court order to shut down, it's business as usual at Cannabis Culture. Flatten them all out and then you pour the weed in where joints are being rolled and sold for $5 each. This is one of 28 shops in Vancouver that is in a dispute with the city over licensing. The chain was raided last year. It's one of hundreds across Canada shut down by police only to reopen. Now, though, there are fears of a severe crackdown. Legal stores are not opening up. Legal supply lines are being choked off. This pot activist says she's frustrated by the bureaucracy that threatens to cut off marijuana to those who want it. At this moment, cannabis culture is in negotiations with the city, um, figuring out how much time there is to respond and what our response will be. In the wake of the ruling, pot shop and dispensary owners have a decision to make. Close their doors, or like the owner of this chain, Don Briere, keep the business running and appeal the ruling. Well, I'd say he's wasting his money. I think that the law is very firmly on our side. The mayor of Vancouver insists he understands the issues, but Kennedy Stewart says the illicit shops have to face up to reality. Realize that the jig is up, really. There's nowhere else to go. And instead of investing their time in more court cases or other kind of, I think, actions that aren't going to work, just, just get on with your business. You know, just, just uh, shut down your current operation, apply for the proper licensing, and then move ahead and invest in that. In the end, this is about business, a flowering, multi-billion dollar business. So no surprise, government not only wants to control it, but reap the revenue it generates. Laura Lynch, CBC News, Vancouver. So while pot legalization is certainly taking time to squeeze out the illegal pot, it hasn't deterred some cannabis companies from their plans to try and dominate the global market. Catherine Cullen takes us to Europe to find out why Canada's pot expertise is in such high demand. Welcome to Denmark's postcard perfect region of Odense. Swaths of agricultural land outside a major city where they grow tomatoes, cucumbers, and now something new. It's actually coming from uh, Canada. A Danish vegetable grower has teamed up with a Canadian cannabis company to embrace the country's new medical pot market. Danes say they're benefiting from Canada being ahead of the game. 
Canada and cannabis is uh, in the front in the world, so they have a lot of knowledge. And this is only the beginning. Aurora Nordic is building a 1 million square foot facility with plans to sell in Sweden, Norway, Finland and Iceland too. They want to be the largest pot producer on the continent. But there's competition. The warm up's over man, now we start playing, it's great, it's just a start. Canada's largest pot producer, Canopy Growth, has its eyes on the global market too. About 90% of my time is international, right? Where I'm going is uh, Europe, South America, last week was Australia. Um, there are now 30 plus countries that want to regulate cannabis. He's building in Denmark as well and exporting to Germany's medical market. He believes in the next few years, more and more countries will legalize recreational pot. And he's trying to position his company for global dominance. If we do it just right, um, it could be one of those great Canadian companies that disrupts the whole world. But back in Denmark, recreational pot remains illegal. I don't, I don't think it's a, a top uh, issue right now. Not enough interest from the public and little support from police mean few politicians here are interested in the legalization debate, he says. If you look at the Danish parliament, I don't think you can today see that there will be a majority uh, uh, towards legalizing. But it's not today that Danish and Canadian businesses are betting on, only that if Canada's example to the world eventually proves to be a good one, others are sure to follow. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. It's worth noting that one of the big changes we've seen here in Canada since legalization is just how many Canadians are getting involved in the cannabis industry. Check out the latest numbers from Statistics Canada. They show that more than 10,000 people had cannabis-related jobs in November, not surprisingly up 266% from the year before. That's a lot. The majority uh, work in agriculture, meaning they are the ones doing the actual growing and producing of the product. Here's some other stories we are watching on this night, starting with the latest on Canada's diplomatic conflict with China. Canadian officials say they've had consular access now to Michael Spaver, the second Canadian detained by China, met with Canada's ambassador to China, John McCallum, today. Spaver and fellow Canadian Michael Kovrig were detained earlier this week. Shortly after Chinese tech mogul Meng Wanzhou was arrested in Vancouver at the request of the United States. We're keeping an eye on Sapporo, Japan tonight after an explosion near a bar injured more than 40 people. The blast touched off a fire so intense at least one building collapsed. Locals said they could smell gas after the explosion. Investigators are looking into what happened. About a thousand people gathered today to pay their respects to victims of the Strasbourg Christmas market attack in a square not far from where the deadly shooting attack took place on Tuesday. And as if to underscore the solemnness of the occasion, another victim has now died. A Polish man passed away in hospital today, bringing the total number of dead to five. The shooter, who was born in that same French city, died in a shootout with police. The investigation into the attack continues. <laughs> And there's a violent day in Brussels as thousands of anti-immigrant protesters hit the streets. Police engaged in running battles with some 5,500 demonstrators organized by right-wing political parties who accused the UN of undermining Belgium's sovereignty. The largest of those, the new Flemish alliance, pulled its ministers from the coalition government last week over immigration concerns. Still ahead tonight on The National, a new twist in the death of that little Guatemalan girl in U.S. Border Patrol custody, why her father is now calling for an independent investigation. And the underwater danger threatening whales off the coast of British Columbia will take you below the ocean surface. And the national interview with Mark Tewksbury, Canada's first openly gay Olympian 20 years after coming out, he sits down with Adrian to talk about why it was so important. And so that was that was the moment where, like, you know, that final tipping point where I just realized I'm obviously not gay enough. You know, this is crazy that I'm doing this dance and losing work. I may as well be honest here.
The death of this little girl from Guatemala continues to break hearts tonight. Seven-year-old Jacqueline Call died in the custody of the U.S. Border Patrol. Tonight, her family is disputing the official account of what happened. Ellen Morrow now on a quest for a better life that's become a search for answers. Jacqueline Kaal Makin's mother and her surviving children. Her young son's clothes, the picture of poverty, Jacqueline and her father were trying to escape. I'm I'm a son of it. I don't feel very well, Claudia Makin says. And Jacqueline's father doesn't feel very well because she died in front of him. Jacqueline's father, Neri Kaal, is disputing claims that Jacqueline did not have food or water in the days before she died. Jacqueline's father took care of Jacqueline, made sure she was fed and had sufficient water. She and her father sought asylum for Border Patrol as soon as they crossed the border. There's also anger that Kaal was reportedly interviewed in Spanish and asked to sign a form about his daughter's health in English when his native language is a Mayan dialect. The family is seeking an objective and thorough investigation and are asking that investigators will assess this incident within nationally recognized standards for the arrest and custody of children. But the Guatemalan consul who spoke to Kaal says Jacqueline's father does not blame U.S. officials and that he's grateful for efforts to save his daughter's life. That hasn't stopped angry protests over her death. Though the Department of Homeland Security has denied responsibility, activists are tying the death to the zero-tolerance illegal immigration policies of the Trump administration. That is why these migrants resort to extreme measures, this woman said. This girl lost her life due to the anti-migrant aggression of this administration. But the politics surrounding Jacqueline's death matter little to this family, distraught and far away. A young mother who'll never see her young daughter alive again. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. Up next on The National, Adrian sits down with Mark Tewksbury. The Canadian Olympian opens up about his decision to come out 20 years ago and what it was like to speak out against the International Olympic Committee. Adrian, I have never in my life run up against such immovable power, just like the force of it. And, and when that power turns on you, it's terrifying. It was 20 years ago this weekend that Mark Tewksbury said the words out loud. The Olympic gold medalist told the world he was gay. It was my time. Hard to overstate what a big deal that was then. Front page news and not just in Canada. Thank you very much. For all the Olympic glory, it wasn't easy being Mark Tewksbury in the 90s. He lost a six-figure contract because he was deemed too gay. Oh, but then came his place as a role model, a leader who all these years later is still standing up for human rights and integrity in sports. And yes, he's back in the pool. He's 50 now. This a photo shoot for his one-man show this weekend. Reflections on pride and purpose and whether time guarantees progress. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> the show is at Buddies in Bad Times Theatre in Toronto, which is where he first came out. So that's where we sat to talk. We're here, obviously, this is where your one-man show is, but it's, this is where 20 years ago you said those words out loud for the very first time. Yeah, publicly, remember? it's true. Publicly. Do you remember how you phrased it exactly? I did it through the story of somebody saying, you're too gay, and then I said, I decided maybe I'm not gay enough. And it was like, <laughs> wah, hear me roar. Why did you have to say it out loud? Like, what was happening inside you that you said, you know what, it's time, I need to do this? Well, I really played that dance. I tiptoed around the issue. I had a boyfriend. I was out at events in Toronto with the gay community. 
But it was that, that constant, where am I, who am I telling, who am I in this situation? And then something happened. I, I lost a big contract. Somebody said explicitly, and it was a closeted gay guy at a corporation that saw me and whatever I did, coming down the aisle to ABBA, dyed my hair blonde. He was like, ur, 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 and he canceled the tour. And sometimes that happens. There's sometimes people within your own community that are still not there and they feel like you're going to betray them if they hire you. So this was, what was this? Was this a speaking tour? Yeah, it was November of 1998. And he actually said the words, I was too gay and I wasn't out yet. And so that was, that was the moment where like, you know, that final tipping point where I just realized I'm obviously not gay enough. You know, this is crazy that I'm doing this dance and losing work. I may as well be honest here. Is there something about coming out then, though, that surprised you? I mean, were there reactions that, that took you aback? Oh, I mean, I remember getting work with an investment banking company and having to fly in from Montreal to Toronto to do an interview first. And I know it was for them to test if I was too gay or not. If, if you came across looking gay or, or acting, acting gay or, or sounding you pass for straight. or all of that, you know, that still existed. And, and I kind of, I decided to go with it. It, it kind of made me angry. Mm -hmm. I would use other language if we weren't on the national. Mm -hmm. uh, but I decided, okay, I can either just, you know, say that's it, I'm not doing it, or be like, okay, I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna double down, and I'm gonna be twice as good as anybody you've ever seen. But to have to go through that was almost humiliating. Well, because you were acting. Or having to audition for something that I really, my resume was the reason they wanted me to speak, yeah. not because I was gay or not. Tell me about the couple who recognized you as the gold medalist and mm -hmm. were so excited to meet you. Yes. And then what happened? Yeah, I was at a really good friend's wedding and I was with my partner at the time and they were exactly, we were at the buffet line. It was incredible. We were just like, oh, Mark Tewksbury, what are you doing here? And I said, let me introduce you to my partner, Benjamin. And it just went like, chill, ice, done, ignored, back turned. It was like, wow, wow. And again, when those things happen, Thankfully, I live in my world where that doesn't happen all the time, but when it does, it's just that, you know, right back to like fag in the locker in grade eight. It's, it's that initial source of shame and hurt over this whole issue. We're talking about this like it was yesterday, but it, it's, it's 20 years <laughs> later, right? Yeah. Um, the coming up part, not the locker. Yeah, that no, was the locker. almost so like young. 35 uh, years ago. <laughs> is, is progress where you thought it would be? Well, I mean, for myself, my life has transformed 100% in the last 20 years from being brave enough to take that step to talk about the topic when nobody wanted to talk about it and enduring years and years of people saying, are we still having to talk about this? And don't worry, I'm as bored as everybody else is sometimes <laughs> about talking about this, but it's still an issue when a major, and I'm not if, but when a major NHL player comes out, it's going to be front page of the newspapers, and maybe then people will go, okay, male, sport, gay, it's done. But it's still not there yet. You know, you think about hockey, and I would have expected that hockey players would have come out at this point. Did, did you think that you would hear from NHL players, like as, as far back as 98? There's this incredible community around hockey that is, unless you're in hockey, I think it's, it's foreign to almost all of us, but I've been invited on the peripheral of that culture twice, where they were ready to have an announcement of an NHL player that was ready to come out, and would I be on standby to go somewhere for the press conference? This is over 10 years ago. Both times it got canceled. So there, it does exist, I'm 100% sure of that. Um, might not have been the big star, you know, that, mm -hmm. that's also something I think. The reason I came out was because there was so much goodwill built around my reputation and who I was. And I think you can leverage that. You can use that goodwill and really challenge people that might be closed-minded to say, surprise, may have to think differently about this issue. And I think a major, major professional basketball player, baseball player, superstar will do that to the American public and to the global public, but it hasn't happened yet. The thing is, there doesn't need to be that many. There just needs to be one that comes out, and that, I believe, could be a game changer. Well, let's talk about the Olympics for a second, because I think if, when you think about gay athletes, you, I, for me, I immediately think of Sochi. 
Mm -hmm. Me and too. And how hard that was. How frightened so many. I mean, I, I spoke with a lot of young athletes who were terrified of somehow being uh, outed, of, of somehow being put in a situation where their liberty was at risk. It was really shameful to target the LGBTQ community. What people don't understand is when the government was out saying that, that's when all the test events were happening. When the athletes were actually coming to the Olympics and they felt in great danger through that process. And thankfully though, that mobilized people. I think that there were a few brave athletes before. Anastasia Busis was a speed skater mm -hmm. from Canada that came out. But after it was a real tipping point, I think, for the LGBTQ community declaring their sexuality. So that's progress. Were you ever in a position to push the IOC for more and then get doors slammed in your face? I mean, I, listen, I was the first instigator pusher way back in 1999. Sorry isn't good enough. You have led Olympism to its lowest point in its history. Screaming about the ethics of how Olympic cities were chosen, calling for one Antonio Samaric to step down. And Adrian, I've never in my life run up against such immovable power. Just like the force of it. And, and when that power turns on you, it's terrifying. Well, has the IOC changed an iota? Ah, I still wouldn't serve on it. You wouldn't serve on it? No, I'm really proud to represent Canada on the Olympic Committee. But I think until you're accountable to somebody, how can you be an institution that has integrity and accountability and value-based and any of it, and still, at the end of the day, closed? Do you see a future for the IOC? I mean, we look at this, what's just happened recently with Calgary saying, no thanks, we're going to take a pass on the Olympics. Yeah, it's, I think it's very devastating. And what a shock that a city like Calgary doesn't want the Olympics. I mean, listen, sport attracts people that are power hungry and because their governance is so difficult to navigate, it's so hard to make change, but it has to and it will. I don't know how yet. It, will it be pressure from the outside? Will it be the corporate world that finally says no? Will it be no cities want to host the games so it's forced well, to that, change? That's that, a road they're heading down now. That's not so far away as it appears. So for sure something has to change, but I think part of the problem with Calgary was no one had the vision, you know? If you're just selling a project on the cost and the bricks and the mortar, it's never gonna fly. So did the mayor screw it up? Oh, I, I put full responsibility on city council and I know that's gonna outrage people and they're gonna be furious and you're not thoughtful and, but I just don't see how we could not take this Olympics and, and really turn it into something beneficial for the city. Well, what if there is no bid city? I mean, wh how does it actually work then? I mean, listen, I'm not the president of the IOC, but if I was, I would take a 100-year approach, and I would look at each 20 years, trying to the five regions of the world, and in each of those, very strategically deciding who's going to become your permanent winter and summer hosts, and build it around the world so the facilities rotate, but use one three or four times before you move to the next so that the facilities are used, and we don't incur this crazy scenario every single time we want to have an Olympics. Just a thought. Maybe the phone will ring. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, Adrian. Some provocative ideas there. As you heard, Adrian and Mark discussing uh, there, the 2026 Winter Olympics are struggling. Most of the bidding cities have walked away, citing the high cost and logistical problems, including Calgary, which still has much of its Olympic infrastructure from 1988. So where do things stand now? The election to decide the winner will be held this coming June in Lausanne, Switzerland, though one might argue they could just flip a coin. Of the seven candidates still in the running just over a year ago, only two remained, Stockholm, Sweden, and Italy's two-city partnership of Milan and Cortina d'Ampezzo. But even they're shaky. Many Stockholm residents are indifferent to the games, while some city councillors are actively opposed. And Italy's national government has refused to throw any federal money into the Olympic pot. Okay, I guess it'll still happen. We'll see. Up next on The National, we'll take you beneath the ocean surface so you can hear what's threatening an endangered species of whale. It was eye-opening. To be a whale, it isn't an easy life, I would say, these days. So uh, this is a recording we made at Lime Film of, uh, of killer whales um, with the ship uh, going by in the background. 
First, though, a preview of a story that you will see here tomorrow night on The National, a rare and intimate look at the front lines of Canada's opioid crisis. We'll take you inside a supervised injection site in Toronto that is facing an uncertain future. Check it out. When I was a little kid, I used to like to draw, but you know, once I started doing drugs, I stopped drawing. And once I found harm reduction, I started drawing again. Uh, I've lost 11 friends this year, and you know, most people don't even lose that many in a lifetime. Right? So I don't want to lose no more friends. <laughs> These OPS sites are, they're everything. These sites are what gives us the chance to save these people. Here's a look at some of the other stories we are watching this week. The truck driver in the deadly Humboldt bus crash is set to make another court appearance on Tuesday. Jaskaret Singh Sidhu has been charged with 16 counts of dangerous driving causing death, along with 13 counts of dangerous driving causing bodily harm. He has not yet entered a plea. And six boys at the centre of the sexual assault scandal at Toronto's prestigious St. Michael's College School returned to court on Wednesday. They faced charges including assault and gang sexual assault. Canadians were shocked last month when news broke of the violent and demeaning hazing rituals at St. Michael's. Toronto police announced just a few days ago they are investigating two more cases now. And liftoff. And SpaceX will cap off its record-setting year with another historic launch this week. For the first time, it will have implications for U.S. national security. The company will launch a new generation of satellites to modernize the global positioning system using a new Falcon 9 rocket. Liftoff is scheduled for this Tuesday at 9.11 a.m. from Cape Canaveral in Florida. Very precise there, aren't they? In the vacuum of space, sound doesn't carry, but beneath the ocean's surface, things can get surprisingly noisy. And that's posing a threat to endangered whales off the BC coast. Researchers are working to measure that threat and reduce it. The CBC's Briar Stewart went to the Gulf Coast Islands to see where things stand. From East Point on Saturna Island, you can look out toward the west coast of the U.S. and Canada. And if it's the right time of year, and you're really lucky, this could be your view. This is one of the best places in Canada, really, to be able to watch the whales from the shore. And this is why they call this the whale trail. Saturna Island is a serene spot, but don't let that deceive you. What is happening underwater is so very different than what we say. We, right here, it's so peaceful and quiet. Well, if a ship is going by underwater, it's not peaceful and quiet. Because the noise emanating from passing ships and boats sound much different to those who call these waters home. This is critical habitat for the endangered southern resident killer whales. They're threatened in part because of a lack of Chinook salmon, their primary food. And also because the sound of marine traffic impacts their ability to hunt for it. To better understand just what kind of effect shipping noise is having on them, there's a lot of research underway to listen in underwater. Let me tell you, this was not an easy place to No, that was to challenging to something. get that. <laughs> Larry Peck and Robert Bruce are part of the Saturna Island Marine Research and Education Society. That's nice deep water right here. A citizen-led group that's installed two hydrophones off the coast of the island. When they heard their first recordings a few years back, they say it was exciting, but shocking. And you could see that these residents especially were trying to forage amongst this din of, of noise. It was a eye-opening. To be a whale, it isn't an easy life, I would say, these days. 
So uh, this is a recording we made at Lime Kiln of, uh, of killer whales um, with the ship uh, going by in the background. So Jason Wood has been while, monitoring and analyzing the orcas and the ship noise off the coast of Washington State. He's a scientist and a diver, so he can repair and maintain the equipment himself. He says the noise can impact the whale's behavior and the way they communicate. Echolocation clicks are used for navigation, they're used for finding prey. If you hide it, in essence, in, from, from, in, acoustically, uh, it makes it harder for animals to find, uh, find their way or to find uh, food to eat. His research found that the whales lose four to five hours of foraging time each day due to noise from ships and whale watching boats. Over the summer, new rules came out requiring whale watchers to stay 200 meters back from the southern residents. And commercial vessels are being urged to slow down. So this is a bulk carrier. This would be carrying something like uh, grain. Orla Robinson is the manager of the ECHO program for the Port of Vancouver. For the past two years, the port has run a pilot project. Between July and the end of October, ships were asked to slow down when they went through the Harrow Strait, a stretch of water the whales frequent. Underwater recording equipment was installed on the ocean floor to measure the noise. So for a vessel like that, um, how much was it being asked to slow down during the pilot? Uh, so this vessel would typically be going about 13 and a half knots on average, uh, and we were asking them to slow down this year to 12 and a half knots. It would add about 15 or 20 minutes onto the trip, but reduce noise by around two and a half decibels. The pilot was voluntary, but 88% of the ships that came through in 2018 complied. Robinson says there should be greater emphasis on designing ships to be quieter because with or without the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion, traffic will inevitably increase. The population alone of this region is predicted to grow by a million people by 2040 and with that, that population growth comes more demand for trade and more demand for transportation. The orca are moving along and, and the noise is following them. And back on Saturna, Larry Peck says that's the struggle. He and his group want to install more listening equipment, but say much more needs to be done. We have the economic imperatives conflicting with the imperatives of nature of our marine ecosystem. Five of them. The federal government says it plans to put more monitoring in place by the time the whales return here next year. But Peck says the situation is dire. I'm not sure that there's a really good understanding in Ottawa of what the implications are here. Uh, you know, the economy certainly is something that's important, but we've got to take a look at the fact that the, our marine ecosystems are long-term. And right now, with just 74 southern resident orcas left, he believes even more needs to be done to try to make their life easier and the environment underwater quieter. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Man, let's all move to Vancouver. Just beautiful. Up next on The National, our moment of the day is the moment the cat came back. I was like, what? I told my mom, why did you mail my cat? And then what did she answer? She said, I didn't know he was in the box. So last week, when Jackie Lake's cat, Baloo, went missing, she and her kids spent a weekend frantically searching for him, putting up misty posters all over their neighborhood in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. They did get a phone call, but not from a neighbor, from Perlator. Baloo, alive and well, was at a shipping facility in Montreal, a thousand kilometers away. Turns out, Jackie had accidentally packed Baloo into a box of car rims she was shipping. And this weekend, thanks to the volunteers at Freedom Drivers, a group that transports shelter animals, the cat came back. That is our moment tonight. I was like, what? I told my mom, why did you mail my cat? And then what did she answer? She said, I didn't know he was in the box. She was wondering why the box weighed 10 extra pounds. Are you excited? Yes, I'm very cat? excited. I just want him to come in the house. Tell me about it. I'm I just want to love him. So we hear the car that just arrived. How do you feel? I'm very anxious. I just want to see him, make sure he's okay. <laughs> oh 
Primero. <laughs> he drove off the entire way from Montreal. All volunteers? Yeah. All volunteers, All volunteers, relay style. It's quite neat to, it, to, to see where he came from. I'm sure he would have quite a story. Yes, his brother's home. <laughs> he missed him. He sat by the door for a whole day. He looked unfazed, though, Balu, to be home, didn't he? Anyway, you know, Fred Penner was onto something there. Someone send him that tape. The cat does come back somehow or other. <laughs> of course that could happen. Cats love boxes. Anyway, that's the National for Defe December 16th. On that note, have a good night. <laughs>